Hi everyone. In this video we're going to be talking about chapter 5, section 5.1 in your textbook. And really all of chapter 5 is talking about probabilities. And if you had um, the same experience I did, which was taking a 7th grade math class in Texas um, you know, several years ago, uh, you probably already learned all of this in your seventh grade math course. And so my hope for you is that this is actually a review. So whenever I talk about a die, I'll use die for singular and dice for plural. You know, one die has six sides, so it's just a cube. In an ideal case, the die is evenly weighted, and so all six possibilities have an even chance of coming up after you roll the die, right? And so the sides are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Also, when I talk about a deck of playing cards, this is what I'm talking about. So notice, um, there's actually 52 playing cards in a deck. That's important to know. There's actually four different what we call suits. So here in this photo, um, each row represents a suits, and so the suits are um, clubs, spades, hearts, and diamonds. Notice that clubs and spades are always black, and diamonds and hearts are always red. And then notice uh, the A stands for ace, and then you have the numbers 2 through 10, as well as jack, queen, and king. So this is what a deck of cards looks like, and we'll be referencing this a lot. Um, in example problems and on your exams. So important to know uh, and be familiar with the deck of cards. Um, now a random process, it's a new vocabulary word for you guys, but um, a random process is just a real world process for which you can't predict the outcome, but you can theorize and sort of measure probabilities. So an example of this might be flipping a coin. Right, so whenever I flip a coin, you cannot always accurately predict the outcome of my coin toss, but you can theorize about the probability of landing heads or the probability of it being tails. Just like rolling a die, or like whenever you leave work and you pull up to the first traffic light, how many cars will be in front of you whenever you pull up to the light? Um, or if you're in, you know, a researcher in Antarctica and you're weighing emperor penguins, um, you cannot predict with exact accuracy the weight of the next emperor penguin you're going to see. But if you know sort of the distribution of weights that are typical for emperor penguins, um, then you can theorize about probabilities um, and assign sort of a probability to some weight range for the next penguin you see. Now, theoretical probability is something we can calculate. So theoretical probability is this formula here, where it's the number of ways the event can occur. We put that in the numerator. And in the denominator, we put the number of, of possible outcomes, the total number of possible outcomes. And so as my example, what's the pro theoretical probability of getting a 2 when you roll one die? So we say the probability that we're about to roll a 2. Well, how many different ways can I get a 2 if I'm just rolling one die? Well, I can actually get a 2 one way. Of course, the side of the die has to be facing up. That's the only way. And the number of different possible outcomes are actually 6, because a dice has 6 sides. And um, here, say that the theoretical probability of getting a 2 when I roll one die is 1 sixth. And this is an important place to stop and note that um, when you are asked about a probability, you can either report this as a fraction, a decimal, or a percent. And if it's an open-ended question on a test, I will actually give you full credit regardless of how you report your answer. You can choose whatever you feel most comfortable with, reporting it as a fraction, decimal, or percent. Um, but if you're taking a test and I give you some multiple choice question, I'm maybe going to put all of the choices, all the answer choices in one of these formats. So they'll be all fractions, all decimals, or all percents. And um, 
you'll have to be able to convert freely between those three so that way you can find the correct answer choice in a multiple choice question. Um, so, you know, what I want you to do is I want you to be able to be comfortable going from one to the other. And so I'm about to pull out a calculator and I'll show you. So here's my calculator. And if you have the probability of um, getting a two as a fraction, which is one sixth, and you want to report it as a decimal, all you have to do in your calculator is one divided by six, enter. And this is one sixth as a decimal. And I usually don't keep all of the same significant figures of the calculator, but I might keep like three or four significant figures like that. Lastly, if you want a percent, I always point out that per means divide by, and cent means 100. Like a, a centennial celebration, celebrating 100 years of something. And so if whenever you, whenever you hear somebody say, oh, well, um, you know, there's a 75% chance of rain today. Well, percent means divide by 100. So if I want this as a fraction, I have to just do 75 out of 100, okay? So 75% and 75 out of 100 are the same thing. And you can always simplify, well, most of the time you can simplify a fraction. So this one would become 3 fourths whenever we simplify that fraction. Um, and in the same vein, you know, if you divide by 100 to go from percent to fraction, well then to go from decimal to percent, all you have to do is multiply times 100. And so we'll take the decimal answer we had before, multiply by 100, and we get 16.67%. Okay, so make sure you know how to get between those three ways of reporting your answer. Very important. All right, so now what's the th theoretical probability of getting an eight when you roll two dice? So not just one, but um, rolling two dice at the same time. The answer to this question is maybe a little bit um, more involved than you think. And I think one of the best ways to illustrate this is by drawing a little table. But first, just just to imagine, you know, each of your die have um, each of your dice has sides labeled one, two, three, four, five, six. And so, if you actually want to roll an eight, we're talking about adding up the face up on both dice. So, if you roll like a two and a six, that would get you an eight. And if you roll a three and a five, that would get you an eight. But if you roll a five and a five, that would get you a ten, right? And so whenever I add up the sum of both dice, what's the probability that we get an eight? That's what we're asking. So just like I said, I'm going to make a little table here. And I hope it's large enough for you guys to see on video. But in this table, I'm going to write one, two, three, four, five, six across the top because those are the different possibilities I might end up with if I were to roll my first die. So maybe this is um, my first die, just randomly labeling that, that one's gonna be the blue die. And then over here, we'll have my green die, or my second die. I'll write those possibilities on the vertical side here, so I'm labeling my rows, one, two, three, four, five, six now. And like any good table, what we're gonna do is divide it up into rows and columns. And I uh, have to give me a moment before I show you what's coming next. Now what we have here in this table, we have six rows and six columns, which means we actually have 36 little boxes here. And each one of these po boxes is going to represent a possible outcome, right? So if I have 36 boxes, boxes, I also have 36 possible outcomes here. So like one possible outcome would be first rolling a three and then rolling a five. So that represents that box right there as a possible outcome. Or maybe I roll a six and then a one, and this is the particular outcome, right? 
So I have 36 possible outcomes because 6 times 6 is 36. And then what I'm going to write in each of these boxes is just um, the sum of the row and the column. So here, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, 4 plus 1 is 5, 6, and 7. Now 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 2 is 4, 3 plus 2 is 5, 6, 7, 8. 6 plus 3 is 9. Uh, 6 plus 4 is 10, 6 plus 5 is 11, 6 plus 6 is 12. And now hopefully you got the idea and you can fill in the rest of these boxes yourself. Just to add the row number with the column number and that's what we're going to write inside. But the pattern I want you to notice is this. If I roll 5 and 3, that's an 8. If I roll 4 and 4, that's an 8. If I roll 3 and 5, 8. And 1 and, sorry, 2 and 6, that's also an 8. So all of my 8 outcomes occur on that diagonal across and it turns out that there's just five ways to get an eight whenever you roll two die there's five ways to get an eight and we just put them on the board there so going back to my theoretical probability formula when we ask what's the probability of getting an eight when I roll two dice well, the number of ways this can occur is actually five different ways that that can occur, right? We just, just showed you where the five, you know, ways that event can occur lie in that table of possibilities. And then we divide by the total number of possible outcomes, which is, like I said, 36. And so as a fraction, this is 5 over 36. As a decimal, we just do 5 divided by 36, which is um, 0.1389. And then a percent would be 13.89%. Because remember, to get a percent from a decimal, you just multiply by 100. Excellent. Now, you might ask, what's the theoretical probability of drawing two kings consecutively out of a standard deck of playing cards? What's the theoretical probability of drawing two kings consecutively out of a standard deck of playing cards? Well, so how many ways can that occur where I draw two kings consecutively? Well, this could be that way, one and then two, or it could be this way. I could draw one and then two, and then one and then two, and you can, you know, count those up. And uh, quite a few ways. I think it's... Um, Let's, let's, let's break it down into two uh, different actions that's happening, two different events that need to happen in sequence. And um, what's happening right here, whenever I draw two kings consecutively, is that I have event number one, which is drawing the first king. And then I have event number two, which is drawing the second king. And what I'm asking here is what's the probability that I have both event one and event two take place one right after another, right? So neither of those events fail to occur. I draw the first king and I draw the second king. Well, so the probability of this first event only, the probability of drawing the first king, well, the number of ways that can occur is four, because there's four kings in the deck, and then the number of possible outcomes when I draw a card from a deck at random is 52. This will be four over 52, and I can simplify that to 1 13th if I want to. The probability of drawing the second king after I've already drawn the first king, well, the number of ways that can occur is actually three. Because after I've already drawn the first king out of the deck, there's only three kings that are remaining. Um, and then, of course, the no total number of possible outcomes. Well, if I've already drawn the first king out of the deck, there's only 51 possible outcomes, right? So um, I can simplify three over 51, I believe, as uh, one over 17. Yeah, okay. And so the probability of both of these things happening, 
Well, it's going to actually be the probability of the first thing happening and then the probability of the second thing happening. And I'm multiplying these and not adding these because really um, the probabilities should be pretty small that this is going to happen for you, right? I mean, the probability does not go up with each successive king that you require. So I'm not adding these, but actually I'm going to want to multiply these because whenever I do two events in a row, each pair of events represents a possible outcome. So I can say 13 times 17. Uh, 13 times 17 would be the total number of possible outcomes here. And there's only one way. Well, sorry. There's actually more. There would be 4 times 3. There's actually be 12 ways that this could occur. But I've already simplified these fractions. And so um, that's why I'm saying 13 and 17 for the denominator. Okay, so 13 times 17. I get 221 for my denominator. So um, the probability of drawing two kings consecutively out of that is 1 out of 221. We've been talking about theoretical probabilities. We're also going to talk in chapter 5 about empirical probability. The difference here is that theoretical probability is taking your best guess at what should happen. So think back to the examples we did. We didn't actually roll any dice, we just thought what's the probability, what should happen. Um, empirical probability is when you actually do perform some experiment and you look back at what did happen. That would be empirical probability. It's based on data that you've collected. It's based on an experiment that's actually taken place. So we're talking about empirical probability. Our formula for empirical probability is going to be the number of times that event occurred in the numerator divided by the total number of outcomes that we witnessed. And so consider our little, ish, our little problem down here. Um, we have in the last 800 times someone's played the airport slot machine, there have only been six jackpots awarded. And so if you play one more time, what's the probability that you're going to win? Well, this probability of winning, so the event here that we're talking about is the probability of a win at the slot machine. I can calculate the empirical probability. Notice I can't really calculate the theoretical probability because I don't really know what software the slot machine is running. And so that's, that's something that's outside of my my realm, what I'm allowed to know about the slot machine. But I can calculate the empirical probability by saying, well, the number of times someone's won, that's six, that goes in my numerator, and the number of total outcomes that we witnessed at the airport as we sat and we watched 800 people play the slot machine. So the probability is six out of 800, or we could simplify that to just um, three out of 400, not, not a lot simplified there, but uh, as a decimal this is going to be 0 0.0075, or as a percent this would be 0 0.75%. Okay, so again fraction, decimal, percentage, either way. Uh, I will take that as an, as an answer on an open-ended part of the exam, but I want you to know how to convert between these two, right? Now, let's say that um, you're playing Yahtzee, which is a board game where you roll a bunch of dice frequently. Um, and while you're playing Yahtzee with your friend, you actually suspect that your friend is cheating, and you accuse your friend of using what's called a loaded die, so a loaded die is a die where you prepare it so that maybe there's a weight um, on the side on the face of the die that's opposite the number six. So if you want to roll a number six is a lot in a game, um, of course that weight would increase the probability of rolling a six. And so if you accuse your friend of using a loaded die and he denies it, one way you could test is just roll that die a lot 
roll it a huge number of times, and then check to make sure uh, that your um, empirical probability it should be roughly equal to you know it should be a good approximation of the theoretical probability and remember the theoretical probability is um, one sixth for rolling a six with normal die of course if you roll this die a huge number of times like let's say you roll the die like 600 times and the number six comes up, let's say, 215 times, well, you would say, nope, <laughs> that empirical probability is actually quite a bit more than the theoretical probability. And so then that would sort of um, confirm quite strongly your accusation. It would it really shed a lot of evidence toward the fact that your friend is using a loaded die. Now, the law of large numbers states that when you measure the outcomes of a random process, the empirical probability is allowed to deviate from the theoretical probability for a small number of trials, right? So in my previous example, I'll go back to it, I said that you need to be rolling the die a huge number of times, right? Like something like 600 times. Um, and the reason I said that is because if you were to only roll this die six times, you wouldn't expect the outcomes to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Even though that would give you the correct theoretical probability, you would almost certainly expect to get some other outcomes that besides you know one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so the empirical probability may deviate from the theoretical probability for a small number of trials. However, with a large number of trials, the empirical probability will converge to the theoretical probability. So like I said in my previous example, um, if you're using a really large number of trials, like 600 trials, where you roll that die 600 times, you should expect the number of times it comes up six to be about 100. And it's okay if it's like 101, or if it's like 97, or it's like 104. You know, small deviations are okay, but um, you know, whenever you have a large number of trials, uh, the relative deviation of the empirical probability from the theoretical probability should be, you know, rapidly approaching zero as you conduct more and more trials. This is the law of large numbers. Um, oh yeah, and we can do an, a simulation on Excel. I you know, didn't even think about this, but we can actually do that. We can actually roll dice uh, really quick and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so here we go. If I want to simulate rolling one die in Excel, I'm going to type in equals rand between and then one comma six. And so each time I press um, F9 on my keyboard, this is going to generate a random number between one and six, which is exactly what happens when you roll a die, right? So you get a different um, random number between one and six, right? Whatever the face up is. So for a small number of trials, like I said, if we just roll this die six times, the theoretical probability of the outcome of a one, two, three, four, five, or six, well, theoretically, those all have the same probability of appearing. Theoretical probability, okay. So my theoretical probability is that this is um, you know, one out of six for each of these outcomes. And my empirical probability is actually something we are going to calculate. our empirical probability would be um, the number of times that this outcome occurs divided by the number of total outcomes that we witness. So I'll do count A. 
So again, my empirical probability now for the outcome one is one out of six because there were six total outcomes and um, only one of those had the number one. But if I were to calculate this for two or for five, it would actually be two out of six. If I were to calculate that for four or for six, it would actually be zero. And so whenever I drag this formula down, I think Excel will generate new random numbers for my dice over here each time. So um, again, with the small, small sample size, each time we roll the dice, we're going to calculate different empirical probabilities. And like I said, since we're using a small sample size of only six, that's totally allowed to happen where the empirical probability deviates quite a bit from the theoretical probabilities. Okay, now let me extend this. And instead of rolling six die for our experiment, let's actually extend this and roll like, I don't know, like 6,000 or something like this. So I'll just, I'll just create a lot of simulated dice rolls. Okay, so now we have somewhere around 5,360 simulated dice rolls. And um, what I want to point out to you is look at the column with empirical probabilities and look at the column with the theoretical probabilities. And you can see that they're actually very, very close now. They're all, you know, 0 0.16 for the empirical probabilities. And then again, theoretical is like, again, about 0 0.16. Maybe this is even more pronounced if I calculate the difference for you, right? So if I take the difference between theoretical and empirical, you know, these are very small differences. Whenever it says e to so 6.2 e negative uh, 0 0.5, what that's saying is that it's the number uh, 0 0.0000. .0000 six two so you're multiplying times 10 to the negative fifth power so uh, just in case you didn't know what e means in excel um, that's what it means so anyways the difference between empirical and theoretical is very 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 small again that's because i have a large sample size if i if i use a really tiny sample size it's, it's okay to have big differences but the law of large numbers is stating you know perform your experiment a large number of times and the empirical probability will have only very small differences from the theoretical probability. Okay, so new scenario, just to run this through and see what you think. Suppose that you bet $10 on a coin toss, and you lost that coin toss. So you bet another $10 on a different coin toss, hoping to win back your money, and you lost again. So you decide to bet $10 again on a third coin toss, and you lost again, and then you decide again to bet $10 on a fourth coin toss. Now, on this fourth coin toss, what would be your probability of actually winning the coin toss and not losing? Okay, so here's the answer. Um, the answer is one half. And I say this, and maybe this is totally obvious to you, if it is, good. Um, whenever someone thinks that the probability here is more than one half, that's what we call the gambler's fallacy. So the gambler's fallacy comes up whenever you're, you know, at the casino with your friends and you hear them say something along the lines of like, uh, I'm due for a win. Like maybe they've been playing um, the same slot machine for a long time where they've been playing craps for a long time and they just haven't had any good luck uh, at the roulette table for example they've been losing 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 and they rationalize to themselves well i've lost 10 times in a row so i'm actually due for a win like you know in order for this to balance out um i'm actually i, I deserve to win somehow or, or maybe the probabilities are more likely that i'll win because i've lost so many times in a row that's the gambler's fallacy. And again, the true answer is that every coin toss has a one half probability of being heads or tails. So that probability and the probability of any random process actually does not change based on the previous 
iterations. So be aware of this. Now, the probability of any single event has to be between 0 and 1. This is just a rule that every probability must follow. The probability of any single event must be between 0 and 1. And this is uh, as a decimal, but um, in percent, you could say that it has to be between 0% and 100%. Right, you can't have a larger than 100% chance of something happening. Also, another rule of probability that's very important is all possible outcomes, whenever I consider the probability of each and all of the possible outcomes, they have to sum to 1, where I'm talking about 1 as the decimal, and um, if you're more comfortable with percents, we would say that it has to sum to 100%. So, for example, if I say, you know, there's only uh, two outcomes that could happen here with your uh, motorcycle jump over the canyon. Um, either you're going to land it successfully and be very popular, or your motorcycle is going to fall into the canyon and, and you're going to be seriously injured, right? Those are the only two possible outcomes. Uh, I would give you a 40% chance of, of landing this successfully, and I would give you a 70% chance of, of crashing into the canyon. Well, you say 40% plus 70%, that's 110%. And so my argument is uh, kind of dumb, right? The probabilities of all possible outcomes have to sum to 100%. And the last thing I'll mention and one little bonus tidbit at the end of the video is that the word subjective means that someone just guessed, right? It's up to the particular person who's making the guess. And so one example of subjective probability is when you hear people talk about sports and they say, oh yeah, I think there's a 30% chance that our football team is going to win this Saturday. Well, you know, that's just a guess. No one really has any data that they're crunching. Um, the theoretical probability of a win, you know, if the possible outcomes are just winning and losing, if our, let, me, let me write that down. If our possible outcomes are winning um, or losing, then that's uh, two possible outcomes. And so the theoretical probability would just be one out of two, because winning represents one out of two possible outcomes. And so whenever someone says that there's a 30% chance, that's clearly not the theoretical probability. It's clearly not an empirical probability, because no one has seen yet what the, uh, no one's observed any iterations of the, of the football game that's about to happen this Saturday. But, uh, you know, this is what we call a subjective probability because it's a random process and someone's just giving it their best guess. All right, see you in the next video.